it's really good to work with somebody who, who knows it inside out because I have to confess, you know, when I started, uh, when we started putting our books onto audio, I, I did not really know how the system worked at all. <laughs> so it's good to have somebody who knows what they're doing um, work through it. It, it, it wasn't the easiest um, uh, choice to make. And in the end, I think you nailed it perfectly, Graham. So thank you. <laughs> One night in the early 80s, a young man burst through the doors of a police station in Moss Side, Manchester. He was frantic with fear. Some men are coming with machetes, he shouted. They're going to chop me up. The desk officer flattened a buzzer. And within seconds, bobbies were pulling on their jackets and running outside. Peter Walsh, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Very good. Now, you've written lots of books about organised crime. Why are you attracted to that genre? I think it, it interests me because it's an area of life which is largely hidden. So when I worked as a journalist, the stories that interested me the most were the ones that people didn't want you to get. Basically, um, I, you know, I like to I like to do what is called they call investigations, I guess, really. But it was really trying to um, trying to find out things that somebody somewhere didn't want you to know and that was in the public interest. So um, and crime would you know, definitely falls into into that category and organized crime in particular. Uh, and there's a there's this kind of healthy appetite for it because it, it is an area of life that people are very interested in it but they, they're not really exposed to it. They don't really know it. They might know some people who are kind of on the fringes or on the periphery, and it holds a fascination for them because it's it's a whole area of life which they don't know anything about. And you know, to be honest, a lot of people find quite exciting, although the reality of it is, is often very different from that. Yeah. Do you think it's because of there's been so many movies about organised crime and that? Has that got much to do with it? Because as you say, the reality, and you really do go into the, the reality of it in Gang War, and the reality is very different to the, the glamorised version of it that Hollywood serves up. But you think, but you think yeah. movies could be responsible for, the, for, the, for some of the interest in it? The, there, is, there's, there's, there is a kind of a relationship, definitely. Uh, I mean, if you, if you look at um, films like the you know the godfather it, it's interesting that you often have people in the underworlds starting to copy things that they've seen in the movies it, it, it has a kind of a, a symbiotic relationship sometimes that they kind of feed off each other but um I, I guess that the reason that you see a lot of films and tv series is that you know just in from a writer's point of view they're just very strong stories um you know the the essence of um the essence of drama <clears throat> is conflict and obviously the underworld is is filled with, with conflict so characters are, are always in conflict with each other either within the same organization because you have power struggles or with the cops and the and the bad guys uh, or you know different different organizations or gangs against each other against rivals it's basically rife with conflict and that's what makes it so i guess um, dramatically appealing as a subject matter so when you were a journalist did you end up reporting on some of the things that are covered in the book? Yeah, that was kind of how I started, really. I wasn't a crime reporter. I was a general news reporter. So I, I would cover all kinds of stories on all kinds of subjects from politics to sport to whatever. Um, but I, And who did you work for? Uh, well, I ended up at the Manchester Evening News in about 1993. I'd worked in, in London for a couple of national newspapers before that. And I moved to the Evening News and moved there at a time when um, what was the conflict which I write about in Gang War was kind of at a bit of a peak. So I kind of arrived in this city, which I knew quite well anyway, because I'd been a student in Manchester years before, um, that had this sort of ongoing conflict. And what struck me quite early on, although I, I wasn't working on it myself regularly or full time, um, was that there seemed to be a lot of individual stories. There was a, there'd be a shooting or a murder or a robbery or whatever, or a police raid, a big drugs bust. And it was often um, sort of described as gang related, but nobody ever joined the dots and said who these gangs were or what the conflict were about. Um, and, uh, you know, who were the leaders? Um, where did they come from? How did the whole thing happen? And it struck me there was a bigger story behind the story and it, it just kind of interested me. So I started to sort of collect information as I just sort of went about my kind of day job, really. Um, and at a later stage, I, I reported on 
some of the incidents in the book, some of the people in the book. I got to know a few people who worked in the security industry in Manchester, which at the time was kind of quite heavily gang infiltrated. And you'd find that people on one side would talk to you and tell you about the other side. And then people on that side would talk to you about their rivals and so on. Uh, and I just sort of decided at one day, I thought there's, there's a book here. There's a book that tells the story of these conflicts that have all happened in quite a short period from the late eighties, really, up until the sort of early two thousands. There was, um, you know, there were some very clear storylines that you could you could tell, and there were certain characters who emerged who were the prime figures, if you like. So that was where it came from. But it came from just yeah, working there as a journalist and just seeing that there was a story and wondering what was behind it. So then, once you started researching it properly, what shocked you the most? I think probably what shocked me the most was how. Um, this all went on sort of in parallel with normal day to day life for everybody. It, it was kind of running along the same track in this uh, a city, which at the time Manchester was on the cusp, really, of a, a renaissance. Um, they were um, spending a lot of money and putting a lot of effort into rejuvenating the city. So I think the first big development was the gay village in the city centre. And then it's spread outwards, a kind of um, building new hotels, flats, apartments. There was a deliberate attempt by the city to encourage a kind of 24 hour culture. Um, Tony Wilson's famous 24 hour party people, uh, uh, you know, a, a city of cafes and bars and restaurants, kind of based on a European model of somewhere like a Barcelona. Um, the city put in a bid for the Olympics, which was unsuccessful, then bid for the Commonwealth Games, which was successful. Uh, Manchester United were the most successful football team in the country at that time. So uh, from being um, uh, like a lot of northern cities had gone through a pretty grim time in the 80s with high unemployment, the city was sort of rejuvenating. Yet at the same time, you had this very serious crime problem, gang problem, a lot of it related to the drug trade, which was kind of tied in to that 24 hour party club scene culture, which had emerged. So it was like this sort of uh, shadow that nobody wanted to talk about much, but that went hand in hand with the city's renaissance really. Um, and it was also, it was the only city in the UK really that that was happening. There was, London had some sort of similar street gang problems in that same period, but other major cities didn't to the same extent. So there was something quite unique about Manchester as well in that period. It got the nickname Gunchester. Was that a fair nickname? Um, I guess in comparison to other places, it probably was. I mean, these things are going to happen. That's what the media's. <laughs> that's what the media's going to do. They, they, yeah. they quite enjoyed the Manchester nickname, which, which uh, you know, is uh, indicative of a, a very lively clubbing scene. And I guess with the good, sometimes you have to take the bad as well. Um, like all things, it can be exaggerated. I mean, most of the violence. This doesn't um, excuse it in any way, but it was confined to particular groups of people in particular areas. It, it wasn't the case that if you like, a lot of innocent people were getting hurt. It did happen though, you know, you had crossfire incidents and cases of mistaken identity. In some cases, people were murdered because of cases of mistaken identity. But generally speaking, it was self-contained and quite self-contained within small groups of people. They weren't enormous um, uh, groups of people and they tended to, um, they, they were quite territorial, so they had their particular, the particular areas of Moss Side, particular areas of Hume, particular areas of Salford, particular areas of Cheatham Hill, um, where they would be very influential, but outside that, pro probably not. <clears throat> and how much of a factor did race play? <clears throat> um, how much of a part was, did race play? Sorry. Yeah, yeah a, a, a big part. Um, the, the gangs kind of... Um, uh, divided themselves along racial lines that sort of reflected the racial segregation of different areas of Manchester. So if you, you know, if you went into Moss Side, you'd have a very high, uh, you know, ethnic Afro, Afro Caribbean community, quite a lot of ethnic Irish as well. Um, Cheatham Hill, uh, similar, but more uh, African, um, people of African descent. Uh, Salford was 
almost exclusively white at that stage. You, you wouldn't um, you wouldn't see um, many young black people uh, in Salford, and so the gangs, <clears throat> when they congregated in those areas, tended to reflect the makeup. But it, they weren't um, the conflicts weren't specifically racial, um, and I don't. Um, the, you know, the, the gangs themselves are, um, funnily enough, a kind of a fairly broad church. You know, if you were one of them, you were one of them, and you, your background didn't really matter that much. Um, it was interesting in this period that the the National Front, who of course were, were quite big in the 1980s, the National Front, and then after them, the British National Party, they never really established much of a foothold in Manchester, although they did in other cities. They tried to recruit among uh, the football fans and, and this kind of thing. And one of the reasons for that is that one of the more powerful gang families in Manchester, uh, a family called the Noonans, who subsequently became quite um, notorious, they were of Irish descent, uh, family were from Dublin, and uh, they took exception to the National Front trying to recruit um, in uh, Moss Side, and they basically ordered the the person who was trying to do the recruiting to a sit down meeting in a pub, and basically explained to him exactly what would happen if he continued uh, to to attempt to recruit a, a, a National Front branch in that area of uh, Manchester. And he took the hint, and he didn't form a National Front branch. <laughs> So, so was part of what the gangs were doing? Were they self-policing the areas? Was there any, was there any good to come of it? I don't think there was. Uh, the, the, you know, this wasn't a, a case of the sort of old Dewey ID East End. You know, they they were tough, but they they kept the peace kind of thing. <laughs> they 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 would self-police, but it it would be very much in their own interests. So, if they suspected, for example, that somebody talked to the police, even if it was a matter unrelated to them. Uh, that would be looked on, that would be frowned upon. And you might find like the words grass spray painted on your house or, um, you know, in, in some cases you might be quite badly assaulted. Um, so you can call that self-policing, but that's policing to get the, to cow the community, if you like. Um, at the same time, they came from that community and their families lived there as well. Uh, and so they would have, um, especially those who were making money, they would have been a support network for their own kin, their own relatives, uh, and people who were perceived to be part of their organisation. So often they didn't, they wouldn't have even seen themselves as gangs. They were just collections of friends. Um, so I guess it all depends on perspective, doesn't it? It's where you stand if you're an outsider looking in or an insider looking out. But I, I don't think. Um, generally there was a lot of benefit brought to the community they would say however that they were a product of the neglect that that community had suffered anyway from society at large yeah and of course we had thatcher's britain and uh yes, a lot indeed. of people yeah. in the north decided that, that you know that the uh the benefits of the 80s didn't go that far north for a lot of them and there was all yeah that i think they, on, wasn't there? they were almost a direct um uh product of that that mentality i think you know they were the people who were left on the on the scrap heap when um you know unemployment was allowed to rise in order to bring inflation down or for whatever economic reasons they were the people who who found themselves out of work without money a few job prospects if you were you know particularly if you were black you, you, you the the opportunities were not open to you anyway in a lot of areas of life so um yeah, that was was undoubtedly a factor. Whatever some people say, and they they try to claim that it's all a matter of personal responsibility. There is no doubt that in periods like that, um, you see these sorts of gangs, or you know, sort of um, self-sustaining um, kind of mutual aid societies in some way. They form not just in British cities, but in cities all over the world. Yeah, <clears throat> and how about the police? What was their role in it? Because. I mean, to give it some perspective, how in the period that's covered in the book, roughly how many shootings do you took? Because it was just there was just shootings in every chapter. That was the yeah. thing that shocked me when I was reading it, when I was narrating it, was just like bloody hell, there's another shooting and another shooting and and another shooting and then a revenge for that shooting and then but they get the wrong guy and oh yeah. how, just to give for anyone who doesn't know the the kind of that was well, what it, shot the numbers of, of people. Yeah, shot. sort of, sort of. I mean, it, it must have been every day at one stage. I, I mean, I, I, I can't remember the figures for the annual figures um, off the top of my head, but um, 
Yes, they, they, they I mean, they developed an armed response team uh, to uh, the police, um, you know, to a stage that they hadn't had before. They obviously had to adapt their tactics. Um, <clears throat> they, uh, you know, had to, um, when, they, when they were making a, a arrests, they had to have backup that they hadn't had before. They had to wear armour they hadn't had before. I think at first they, they were taken aback by it. They, um, as we described at the beginning of the book, the, the first knowledge that a lot of them had was actually when a, a young guy ran into a police station in Mossad and said he was being chased by a gang with machetes who were trying to kill him. And um, they sat him down and talked to him and he, he starts to tell them about how there was this conflict between two gangs and he'd been caught up in it. And they didn't believe him at the time. They, they just thought it was just a, you know, a one-off fight. And suddenly they discovered that there'd been this conflict going on for um, quite a few months, if not years, and they hadn't really understood it. They hadn't, they didn't understand that. The, the old sort of um, South Manchester detectives would know the older members of the community, if you like, the old, the guys who used to run the Shabines, the illegal drinking clubs, the, the West Indian Blues clubs. They'd know those guys and they had a certain rapport with those guys. They would go and drink in the clubs when they were on duty and talk to people and maybe meet informants or whatever. They didn't know the younger generation. And it was this younger generation that kind of took them all by surprise. They didn't realize how violent they were, uh, how unafraid they were of the law, uh, how unafraid they were of their own, uh, you know, their, their own elders, you know, that, that they, they kind of, they had no respect at all. And it took them all by surprise. And then when you, when the guns then came in as well, which in the eighties were not really a big factor, maybe used in armed robberies, but not generally in conflicts. Uh, if there was a gang fight, it would be fists or maybe knives at worst. Once the guns came in as well, then it, it changed completely. And it was then that these the kind of young men ran the streets. Mm. And you, you mentioned in the book how the police eventually had undercover police in there getting the info. And there's some quite yes. good stories about that. Some actually quite, some quite brave guys. Yeah, they were, yeah. And they would mainly go into Dubai when they were trying to, um, trying to infiltrate um, drug gangs. One of the interesting stories that I found when I was researching the book, which had never been told before, was the story about crack cocaine in Manchester, which is quite an odd one. Um, Manchester, like, like much of the UK, um, there was a lot of media reports of this new scourge from America of crack cocaine, which is supposed to be a highly addictive form of smokable cocaine and had laid waste to American cities. It caused huge huge gang conflicts, it had um, destroyed a lot of lives. And there were a lot of warnings coming over from America that we were going to see the same thing here. And uh, so uh, Greater Manchester Police set up a unit to try and find who was selling crack in the city because they, they wanted to take this seriously and they wanted to try to stamp it out as quickly as they could. So they sent out these undercover officers as buyers posing as, as drug users. And they went to the dealers and Moss Side and, and Hume and elsewhere, Wally Range, and uh, started asking for crack. And the guys, these guys who usually sold heroin and maybe a bit of cannabis, said, we haven't got any crack. And they, the, the buyers persisted, said, no, we, 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 you, you must have. And so they said, come back next week and we'll have some. And they did. It transpired that Manchester at that stage had not had a crack cocaine problem. But by the police going out and buying there, they created a, a market for crack. <laughs> now, at some stage, the officer in charge, the detective in charge, realized what was going on. They sort of halted the operation. They arrested those the dealers that they'd got evidence against. And then they, they kind of pulled out. But by then it was too late. They'd actually created a demand, unwittingly created a demand for the very drug that they were trying to prevent. So... <laughs> That shows that in in policing, you know, bravery and going in there is not enough. You've you've got to really understand what you're doing. But but the drug trade is like that. It's very unpredictable. It's very fluid. Nobody knows what's going to come next. Nobody knows what people are going to want to buy next. And so it it is very hard to proactively think ahead and try to intercept a problem before it becomes big. And in that case, I don't. They failed, obviously. Yeah. And and throughout the book, you can see that it's the drug trade 
and a little bit of prostitution, but mainly the the drug trade that is fueling the whole gang culture and the you know that's where the money is. Yes. Do you think there's there is a case for Britain's drug laws to be changed to make it more lenient so that there's you know because prohibition of of alcohol in the US that's what that's what was was a gift for organized crime. Do you think that yeah. there is maybe I've the... always tried as um, in in the books I've done I, I've always sort of approached them as modern histories and I've I've tried to tell the story of what happened without if you like put trying putting my own views into what I write but certainly and and I've done a lot on the drugs trade and certainly based on what I've seen you have to say that the the method that we have chosen has not worked mm. so um drugs are now um more readily available than ever in the UK the price is i th- i th- i think a, a sort of um an all time low but the um the quality of things for example like cocaine the purity is as high as ever so that that usually means when the price is low and the purity is high that means there's a glut that means there's there's loads of it um there are more drugs available now than ever you know we we've had things like uh, spice and fentanyl and all these other um opioids and this kind of thing and the 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 countries where the main sort of class a drugs are produced so afghanistan for heroin and colombia for cocaine in the last 3 or 4 years they have produced record record all time record amounts of uh, the opium poppy and the coca leaf and the, the purified cocaine so we have to say unequivocally to me that the the method that we have tried has failed yeah um increasingly now countries around the world are experimenting with either um decriminalization or legalization there's a slight difference between the two obviously you know de- decriminalization is basically is, is not not pursuing people uh to the same extent for for many drug crimes legalization is is basically saying it's is no longer against the law but there are more and more countries doing it more and more states in the united states which was always the most bullish on you know worldwide on drug prohibition uh more and more states now uh are relaxing their laws particularly in relation to cannabis so i think that's just the way the world is heading uh in the uk we tend as a country to be generally quite conservative with a small c it can take us a long time to do things that other countries do more quickly it, so it may be that we get there in the end i just think we'll be maybe one of the last in europe for example to do it mm. um there is still a kind of reticence to discuss the issue in the uk um Why, we're reticence being all feeble politicians. and british about it oh from politicians not well, not politicians, culturally po- politicians don't don't like so I mean, it's uh, they almost don't talk about drugs anymore at all uh, you know in the 80s it was a big subject it was um you know margaret thatcher would made a, a big issue of of drugs um it was in the front page of the newspapers regularly big drug busts or action we were taken and it it slowly kind of disappeared off the agenda now whether this is because we now have a whole generation of politicians who themselves dabble with drugs when they were younger and and don't want to talk about it because they don't want to be asked that dreaded question you know did you ever take cocaine or whatever um maybe they just don't see it as a vote winner they they there's still a, they still feel i think that the public are very much on the on the on the side of a draconian approach to the problem i'm not sure they're right i'm not sure that the politicians are behind the population or ahead of them uh, but nobody no mainstream politician uh, really wants to go out on a limb and be the the person who talks about drugs in the way that you know i remember 20 30 years ago david meller for example kind of made his name as the uh, as the minister responsible for for drugs um in the 1990s you you may remember we actually had a drug czar uh, tony blair yeah. appointed yeah. A, a former um, chief constable as the country keith hellowell as the country's drug czar it didn't that didn't last very long a few years um but now it's a subject that politicians th- there's a lot of discussion among academics and um charities and other groups there's not a lot of discussion among politicians which is, is quite interesting
Mm. I, I know they, uh, they'll want the pensioners' vote, and a lot of the older generation are probably... You know, they've yeah. got to get the old people's vote because they always turn out to vote, you know. And They do, uh, yes, yeah. <laughs> so maybe, you know, y y going forward, there'll be a more, I don't know, to use a cliche, a more grown-up discussion about it. I don't know. But y it seems very clear in your book, in Gang War, mm. that you see that, you know, if this if this wasn't prohibited in the same way as it was, you you, you wouldn't have the same kind of market for it. And, and a lot of these problems it wouldn't exist. I mean, they yeah. wouldn't just be reduced. I don't think they would exist, some of the... Because the gangs wouldn't have been... Without drugs, could there have been a gang problem in Manchester? I don't think it would have been the same because they they wouldn't have had... Um, they wouldn't have had the same money for a start. So so they wouldn't have had... Um, they wouldn't have had those the resources. They They wouldn't have had or needed the weaponry because... That that was again. It was that was kind of related to the drugs trade, to having to protect protect you from yourself from being robbed, which is again is a is an artifact of the money. So that kind of escalation of things was, I think, directly related um, uh, to to the drug trade. I can't see anything else that would have um, taken its place. There, you know, there was no uh, the armed robbery, which had been um, a very significant national prob problem in the nineteen seventies. Um, that was largely fading out with enhanced security, you know, less movement of cash, cash in transit, more people using cards, uh, credit cards or debit cards, that kind of thing. Um, and apart from sort of major frauds, there was nothing else really that would have taken its place. So if, if we'd had a sort of legal drug market, it's difficult, it's difficult to see that there would have been anything like that violence. I guess it, as a country, we're probably in a fortunate position now. We can actually see what happens in these countries that are taking a different approach. And we can assess what what seems to work and what doesn't. So, you know, maybe there'll be some pointers there because actually nobody knows, even the people who are very abolitionist and, and really would like it, you know, just 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 make it make it legal, stop penalizing people who want to uh, smoke or whatever. None of us really know what the uh, result of that will be because it, we've never done it. So mm. I think everybody needs to look very carefully at, at what's happening and learn the lessons from that. Yeah, from the likes of Portugal, where I think, has it been, how long has it been now since they decriminalised? Uh, it's been long enough to start having an effect. And I, I don't think they're seeing many negatives, uh, right. you know, at the moment, or certainly they're not being being reported. I mean, there are there are some fears over the, you know, the strength of things like cannabis now and the... Um, links to psychosis and that kind of thing, but yeah, I don't yeah. know how strong I don't know how strong the research is in that, and I also don't know if the the strength of some of the drugs again is is, is a result of their illegality that it it makes it more uh, more worthwhile or there's more profit in selling the stronger stuff. Well, there's uh, one theory to go back to prohibition is when they the bootleggers they weren't they weren't running beer because they'd need to run yeah, yeah. so much of it they were running spirits yeah. so it was it was in a smaller yeah. package so if it's strong yeah. there there is an argument isn't there that because it's illegal it's getting stronger because they don't need yeah. to transport it in as bigger well, quantities yeah well I know a lot of a lot of uh, sort of very high end cannabis traffickers in the late nineties started to complain bitterly. Because the, the the Blair government basically had a change of heart on on uh, cannabis and downgraded it, and uh, very much wanted en law enforcement to focus on the Class A drugs, and so this meant really that um, people were no longer being pursued for cannabis, and you started to see cannabis farms springing up in the UK. Uh, it suddenly became um, a lot easier to get hold of. And the, the the traditional smugglers who'd been bringing it in from Morocco and elsewhere complained bitterly that they'd basically been undercut and that the <laughs> the government had cost them cost them a fortune because what, what, you know they once the, once upon a time they could get whatever for a kilo and now that price had halved and it wasn't worth being in anymore. So uh, right, I don't think they got a lot of sympathy from anybody. We'll have to wait and see. In the yeah. book in Gang War. Uh, near the beginning of the book, you talk about the Quality Street Gang, which is an interesting mm. one because they were one of the original before it started breaking up into the areas, as you say, with with Cheatham Hill and and Hume and Moss Side and everything. Quality Street Gang, though, some people 
don't believe it existed as an organised mm. gang. What's your view, having done the research? Was it a real <laughs> thing? Because because it's such a glamorous thing, isn't it? They're called yeah. the Quality Street Gang, and they're, they're named after the characters in a Quality Street advert, I think it was, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah. Um, um, this is this might sound like a cop out, but I'm go I'm going to say it did and it didn't exist. So um, so the guys who are known as the QSG are very much very much uh, real figures, um, and uh, were very much um, you know faces about Manchester in that period, sixties, seventies, and eighties. Did they see themselves as a single gang, like a mafia a clan, working very closely together? Um, you know, very wary of outsiders. No, they were they were part of the wider Manchester community. They would all have their own business interests as well as their interests which they shared with each other. Um, a lot of what they did um, was legitimate or quasi-legitimate. Uh, so very few of them were out and out criminals. Some of them would say they were barely criminals at all. Um, they came from a sort of background in um, you know, second-hand car sales, boxing promotion, uh, bookmaking, uh, you know, running pawn shops, uh, all that kind of uh, running nightclubs. Um, so part of the, if you like, the kind of colourful tapestry of Manchester. But at the same time, they were also, again, or some of them were early developers of the, the drug trade, which was becoming bigger. Uh, some of them were heavily involved in armed robberies uh, in the 70s in particular, major frauds, uh, more popular in the 1980s. So, uh, yes, they existed. Yes, they were a, um, they, they had a close knit inner core, but no, they were not a, a kind of single entity, if you like. Um, and I mean, some of them are still, still around to this day in Manchester and, uh, um, you know, very wealthy men um would would no longer be involved in crime and would have no need to be involved in crime at all uh and um you know ended up sort of being very well known figures really they were they were very different i would say from the street gangs that came um mainly because they they came into prominence when they were older anyway so yeah. they yeah. they sort of they, they they were very ambitious men. They came from most of them very poor backgrounds, areas like Ancoats, you know, in Manchester back in the day, um, you know, back to back terraced housing with and sure the sort of overspill estate where a lot of people had been moved out from other council estates in in inner city Manchester during slum clearance. And they were they were guys on the make. They were guys who wanted to get on. And if that meant doing something legal, great. If it meant something illegal, fine. If it meant something that straddled the area in between the two, that was that was cool too. And in those days, the the police, it has to be said, were were very much the same. You know, there were a lot of police officers who they took certain activities as part of a perk of their job, and uh, you know, think think blind eyes would be turned. Uh, you know, um, so they were all part of very much that that era. Um, but but most of them, the the core of them did actually become very successful that their their ambition carried them far mm. and so the the book comes out first of all gang war very successful book so then you decide to turn it into an audio book and for you how was the process of turning it into an audio book it was surprisingly straightforward graham <laughs> given given um, you know the the birth pangs of of producing a book which is, a, um, above all, I mean, it's a very long, time-consuming endeavour. Um, to, to, you know, the production of an audio book, although it involves, you know, a, a, a great deal of work from yourself and, and great narration, it's, it seems to be a much, much smoother process now. It's interesting. One of the reasons I, I became a publisher and got into publishing was that at the time, it was at the time that desktop publishing had just become a thing. So the PC was becoming ubiquitous. You know, everyone was getting one at home and you could suddenly do things that you'd never been able to do before. So traditionally, if you wanted to be a publisher, it, you know, you, you had to have a certain kind of infrastructure. Uh, books were printed a certain kind of way. They were typeset a certain kind of way. And suddenly new technology kind of swept all that away. And you could, you could, you could typeset, you could do the layout, you could select the fonts, you could design the cover, you could do it all on your PC. And then just send the files to a, to the printer and the printers would print them off. 
similar with audiobooks. I mean, to me, an audiobook was a was a pile of ten cassette tapes <laughs> that you would have to work your way through. But now, of course, it's it's all changed completely. The the process is so much uh, simpler and and smoother. So um, I I found it great. Yeah, you know, really good. Um, obviously, you're tremendously experienced in this um, this field yourself now, and uh, it's really good to work with somebody who who knows it inside out. Because I have to confess, you know, when I started. Uh, when we started putting our books onto audio, I, I did not really know how the system worked at all. <laughs> so it's good to have somebody who knows what they're doing um, work through it. And it's also it was an interesting book to do because it, 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 in choosing the um, choosing the, the narrator, it's a, it's a tricky one because although this is a book which is very much set in one place, it's very specific to Manchester and Salford. Um, it's a third person. It's a journalistic kind of history, so it's not a book being told in the voice of somebody from that place necessarily. So yeah. that, that was quite a difficult one to think about it. it so the, the accent where in, in, if, if it was a first person autobiography of somebody from Liverpool or somebody from Newcastle, you know how you want them to speak in this instance, it was, it was much more important that the voice was, I guess, needed to be authoritative and engaging at the same time. So you had to want to listen to the story and then it just had to be a voice that didn't jar with the subject matter. So an American narrator would not have worked, for example, and, you know, a Scottish or Welsh, probably not, but just somebody from the kind of generally the sort of North, Northwest of England who could, as I say, deliver it in an engaging manner and an authoritative manner. So it, it, it wasn't the easiest um, uh, choice to make. And in the end, I think you nailed it perfectly, Graham. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. very Well, thank you for choosing me. It was a terrific book to do. <laughs> I mean, it really was good because it really goes into it. It's quite a long book in the end as well. I think. Yeah. I can't remember how yeah, many hours it is. It's one of those books. When I started writing it, it was a question of what to leave out rather than what to put in because there's so much, and um, you know, each one of the chapters could almost have been a book in itself. You know, there were yeah. stories of a particular conflict between two gangs, for example, which if you if you went deeper and managed to get the gang members to open up to you, you could have written a whole book about that or, you know, the, what happened in this with the nightlife and the security uh, industry in Manchester or what happened in Salford as a, just as a micro, just on its own. Um, and there have uh, been individual books written about some of the yeah. individual characters yeah. in, in, in the book. Ab yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So that, that goes to show. So it, it's quite difficult to, to compress the information into a book like this, but also to keep it readable. That's always the challenge I think with a, um, you know, a non-fiction book that covers quite a wide area and, and a lot of people. You obviously want to try to retain the the narrative and uh, the reader's interest, but you also you have to have the detail. Uh, you know, because a that's the story, and b for the plausibility of the book, people need to feel that what they are reading is authentic and it is the real story. Yeah. It's a terrific book, and if you'd like to get it, if you go to the, if you're watching this on YouTube, in the blurb below here, I've put the links for you to get it. If you sign up to Audible for a 30-day trial, you can download the book for free. So uh, take advantage of that, and uh, and just check it out. It's called Gang War. It's by Peter Walsh. What's next for you, Peter? Um, well, the last book I did was this, this similar it was a history of the drug trade in the UK, the, a modern history of the drugs trade, and that. I when I started on it I thought it'd take me about two years and it ended taking me six or seven years so I'm sort of recovering from that um, I've been working on a um, project with um, uh, another law enforcement investigator which um, I can't really mention at the moment but that's something that's going to be coming out later this year um, and after that I'm not sure the decks are clear I've always got uh, plenty of ideas to work on but uh, at the moment i think i just need to take a bit of thinking time and uh, decide on on uh, what's the best one to go after well it's been great talking to you about gang war yeah. i think you should get it you can get it as a book as a you know you want to get it as kindle and whatever I, I would recommend the audio book because uh, it was a lot of fun to do i would and, too uh, yeah <laughs> you would. There's, there's a lot in there uh, peter walsh thank you very much Graham, thank you <laughs>